Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora per nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hormotis nostre. Amen. In nome Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast mass on this, as we said, the Feast of Saint Dominic, Confessor. Apologies for uh, the delay in Mass beginning this morning. Again, to err is human, but to foul things up completely requires internet technology. But we are here now. We are still experiencing here at the chapel, um, we're still experiencing some difficulties with the internet. But please do bear with us. I do try now, if possible, if there is time, if Facebook will allow me, uh, I do delay the time of the Mass. So generally speaking, 8.30 is when it should start, but invariably at the moment it's anywhere between 8.30 to 8.45. So um, please do bear with, but I do try, um, for those of you perhaps who on Facebook use the set reminder or get reminder button, if there is time and I can change it um, uh, when we're going to be delayed, then I believe you should be notified uh, of the new time. So if you do watch via Facebook, uh, utilize the get reminder button uh, and then you will be prompted uh, when mass begins, whether it's beginning on time or whether it's going to be delayed. So today we celebrate St. Dominic, founder of the Order of Preachers, otherwise of course known as the Dominicans. Born about the year 1175 in Castile, Spain, Dominic hailed from the illustrious de Guzman family. First, he was a canon regular at Osma, then he founded the Dominican Order, which was approved in 1216. Alongside the Franciscans, it became the most powerful order in medieval times, giving the church illustrious preachers, for example, St. Vincent Ferrer, and contemplatives, for example, St. Thomas of Aquinas and Pius V, and contributing immeasurably to maintaining the purity of the faith. Through the example of apostolic poverty and the preaching of the Word of God, the friars preachers were led to men to Christ. To St. Dominic is attributed the origin and spread of the Holy Rosary. The two contemporaries, Dominic and Francis, effected a tremendous spiritual rejuvenation through their own spiritual personalities and through the religious foundations. Of the two, Dominic was the realist who surpassed the other intellectually and in organizational talent. His spirit of moderation, clarity of thought and burning zeal for souls have become the heritage of the Dominican order. Legend has contributed the following rare anecdote as preserved in the Roman breviary. During pregnancy, Dominic's mother dreamed she was carrying in her womb a little dog that had held a burning torch between its teeth. And when she had given birth, it set the whole world on fire. By this dream, it was made manifest beforehand how Dominic would inflame the nations to the practice of Christian virtue through the brightness of his holy example and the fiery ardour of his preaching. He died at Bologna upon hearing the liturgy's prayer for the dying, Come ye saints of God, hasten hither ye angels. There are, of course, still Dominicans to this day. And to be fair, on the whole, they present perhaps the more conservative strains of theology in the contemporary situation uh, in the church. That is to say that whilst on the one hand, um, acquiescing, uh, to the um, acquiescing to the promulgation, oh sorry, acquiescing to the contemporary magisterium uh, and its teachings nonetheless, 
we may say of the Dominicans that they have always tried to uh, interpret uh, the faith in the lens of tradition. I think it would be fair to say that uh, the difference between uh, contemporary Dominicans and their forebears is that the Dominican order today views history and theology through the lens of tradition as opposed to previously the light of tradition. It's rather a pity because the Dominican order was established first to preach the orthodox faith against the Albigensian heresy in southern France in the medieval uh, period. And it has generally been the Dominicans to whom the church in subsequent centuries has looked to to provide um, a steady uh, steer. Thomist theology, of course, derived from uh, the systematic, uh, sorry, the, a systematic schema of theology attributed to St. Thomas Aquinas and therefore named after him, has until the Second Vatican Council uh, been the mainstay uh, of the Church in the West's uh, interpretation uh, and understanding of doctrine. Particularly from uh, the time of the Council of Trent forward, uh, when St. Pius V, who of course himself was a Dominican and retained his white Dominican habit as Pope, which is why Popes since have worn white. Prior to that, by the way, Popes wore red, uh, like the Cardinals. Um, certainly from uh, the Council of Trent onwards and the establishment of uh, seminarial formation as we would now recognize it, that is houses uh, of residence for candidates to the sacred ministry being formed uh, and taught uh, all in one place as opposed to being apprentices of uh, bishops previously, depending, We've, we have talked about that before, um, but the Thomist schema of uh, theology figured very heavily uh, in the seminaries. The seminarians gradually working their way through the great treaties uh, of Thomas Aquinas, the Summa Theologica, or Summary of Theology, which, as I say, was the mainstay of seminarial formation right up until the Second Vatican Council. Afterwards, what's taught in our seminaries today uh, varies uh, for philosophy, certainly, and for foundational principles in theology. Uh, Thomism, perhaps, still wins out, but, of course, it is uh, competed or, um, yeah, competed against um, contemporary uh, trends uh, in philosophy and theology. So whereas before uh, priests came out of the seminaries pretty much uh, as Thomists, uh, today they don't. Today they don't. This is, you see, the pernicious and insidious nature of modernism, of the modernism that has infected the church. Believe you me, my brothers and sisters, this is a virus far worse than COVID-19. This is a virus that, not can, that can not only kill the body, but also the soul. Modernism, I'm talking about, not coronavirus. It is insidious, it is pernicious, it is, as St. Pius X called it, the synthesis of all heresy. And in part because 
of the way that it preys upon, ultimately, the pride and vanity of the victim, but does so in what well, well, can only be described as an insidious way, in the sense that modernism ultimately skews subjective appreciation. I think that may be the best way to describe how it works. It persuades the victim to lay greater emphasis on their subjective appreciation of anything as opposed to holding fast to an objective or preferring an objective appreciation. And it's insidious because, of course, we all begin with a subjective appreciation of anything, of everything. Subjective appreciation, of course, because how else can we appreciate and relate to and understand anything? But, whereas, under the Thomistic scheme of theology and philosophy, one would reason and rationalize and be able to tell the distinct difference and draw the distinctions between the subjective appreciation and the objective, modernism amplifies or lay or emphasizes the subjective over the objective. And this has particularly developed in the last 100 years. Actually, it's a bit longer than that, but, um, well, it's, let's say for the last 200 years. I mean, essentially, since the so-called Enlightenment, where the vanity of humanity became manifest in the development of technologies and the development of invention, in the development uh, of science and scientific exploration and knowledge. Now here, let me be clear, there should be no um, contradiction between science and reason and faith. And yet so often we are told that there is. The followers of the Enlightenment believing that now they could work out how everything worked and could even invent, create things that therefore they had no need of God. They had no need of divine knowledge to tell them how the world worked. They could discover it and find it out for themselves. And in doing so, of course, what they began to do was to build and create things for themselves. As they grew through experimentation in knowledge, so they grew bolder. Now, it has to be said that we, all of us today, benefit hugely from the great technological advancements and certainly the great progress is made in uh, medical science, such that every one of us today owes a tremendous lot to the pioneers, as it were, of certain uh, technological uh, and medical um, advancements. But we are fools to think that these did not come at a cost. They have come at a very great price. 
which is the loss of salvation of a great many souls. Rather than appreciating that God in the first place had given them the abilities, the skills, the talents, the predispositions, the wherewithal to be able to observe and analyze, process and reproduce their innovation and to, in technology and science and medicine. Instead, these engineers began to believe, as it were, in their own hubris. So that today, science has become almost like an alternative religion. Even though science cannot simply and plainly explain the reason or cause for our existence, the reason or cause even of the universe. And certainly, most science is far more complicated and more difficult to understand than philosophy and theology. But we may say that the rise and development of modernism is largely attributable to this advancement in technology and science. And this is at once immediately reconcilable. It does not have to be this way. There is no contradiction between theology and science. For sure, we can appreciate that science can explain in minute detail sometimes how things work. But, of course, there is a danger. There is a danger with that. And in recent years, well, actually, since the middle of the 20th century, since the Second World War, there has been a considerable danger. Because in their endeavour to understand or try to understand how things work. Scientists, of course, have become bolder and bolder in their experimentation. Though it is heavily disguised and even denied, many of the advances in contemporary medicine particularly around um, psychology, particularly uh, around um, uh, genetics, sadly, are devolved from wicked experiments that c were conducted, conducted upon uh, the vulnerable, Certainly by the Nazis, um, but prior uh, to the Nazi regime as well. Eugenics, uh, rockets, chemical warfare, experimentations on human DNA, things like cloning, etc. In large part, 
are derived from experiments of considerable moral uh, dubiety. Last week, the news broke that in Holland, a new law has now given license to scientists to experiment with both human and animal DNA. There is a stipulation that anything created must be destroyed after 12 weeks. But nonetheless, chimerism is a reality. Chimerism being the fusing of different species. Already, of course, we have seen such work um, in horticulture. Um, though you might not think it, but when gardeners graft um, one uh, species of rose onto another and develop another kind of rose. That's all the same, similar thing, similar principle. The difference, of course, is that nobody, no human, no soul is endangered by such a process. But that's now, of course, what they're doing. We know too, of course, that the development of most of the over-counter medicine, or that is to say most of the medicine that we take for granted these days, has used genetic material sourced from aborted babies. And all the while, you see, the overarching justification is what? What is basically the so-called ethical argument for defending these types of experiments and utilising the results derived from similar but even worse experiments? humanity. We're told that all of this is to benefit ourselves. And one way or another, of course, certainly it does. And we are all guilty, one way or another, of allowing all this to happen. And we do so because of subjectivity or subjectivism. Because we relate it all ultimately to ourselves. Who among us, for example, would not think twice before rejecting a medicine that could save our life or the life of someone we love, even though it may have involved the use of genetic material taken from an aborted baby, even though it may have derived from research derived from wicked and cruel experiments used or employed by Nazi scientists. Many of the drugs that we take and so many of us rely upon for all sorts of conditions 
have benefited from and derived from ultimately the research of such experiments. Beta blockers, um, uh, those uh, those things that asthmatics uh, take, can't remember the name, um, all sorts, all sorts of things that we more or less now today take for granted. If you begin to look in to the background of the history of the development of those drugs, you will ultimately be horrified. And yet, you will be persuaded to equivocate, sorry, to equivocate within your mind, saying to yourself, well, it's done now. Or say to yourself, well, it'll prolong life or save life. You see how insidious and pernicious modernism is. Modernism is not just about progressivism. Modernism is not just about change. It's not just about being up to date. Modernism ultimately is extreme subjectivism, which we all easily succumb to through vanity through pride, the devil's favourite virtues or non-virtues. Ultimately, about self. It appeals, as Professor Dawkins says, to our selfish gene. It appeals to the base sense about ourselves for survival. The base instinct. He calls it the selfish gene. The church has always called it sin. Evil. The pre deliction or predisposition toward that which is wrong. For there will come a time when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap up to themselves teachers according to their own lusts. And they will turn away their hearing from the truth and turn aside rather to fables. Does this not exactly describe the phenomena that is modernism and the contemporary zeitgeist. Keep up to themselves teachers according to their own lusts. Lust, of course, we may understand as passions, we may understand as base instinct. And for sure, people do rather listen to those who advocate or champion or extol their particular vice, their particular lust or passion. Sometimes in a seemingly harmless way 
one, for example, who might be given to gluttony. We'll watch TV programs all about food. Is this likely to dissuade him or cure him from or of his predisposition toward gluttony? No. And I speak as one who knows. If he gives in to himself, if he believes everything that he is told about the food, about cooking, about how tasty it is, how lovely it is, even perhaps how in moderation it might be good for him, how some of it actually isn't necessarily good for him, but it's okay in small doses, etc., etc., etc. All these things, all these experts, all these dietitians and chefs and, and food growers and food producers and manufacturers and so and so and so forth, all of which you can sum up in the advertising that we see for food and drink. All the advertising that we see for leisure and hospitality. All these various voices. To whom one predisposed towards gluttony would rather listen to They'd rather hear all of that than fast. And yet what would be the ultimate cure for their gluttony? But fasting. But extreme moderation in their diet. And bearing in mind today, of course, so much of our food is manipulated deliberately in such way as to make it more desirable. Branded tastes. All designed to encourage you to eat more and drink more. And of course they surround it with a beautiful presentation that says if you eat this, you're cool. If you drink this, you're suave. If you eat this in these surroundings, uh, you are amazing, etc., etc. They will turn away their hearing from the truth and turn aside rather to fables. How many of us, my brothers and sisters, today are persuaded by advertising? Persuaded that we need something that we really don't need. And all the while, what are they doing? They appeal to our pride. They appeal to our vanity. They appeal to our lusts. They appeal to our passions. They appeal to our base instincts it's all about being beautiful all about being desirable and of course they say do this eat this drink this wear this behave like this and you will be the best you can be Likewise, all those lifestyle gurus. Again, always appealing to that which we find appealing. It's all vanity of vanities. It's all subjective.
Now, of course, we've reached a stage where even scientists are rejecting scientific principles, or at least certainly a great many people who claim to follow science are beginning to contradict themselves. So that now, of course, it is possible for someone to determine with no knowledge, no actual empirical experience to determine that they are something contrary to their physiology, to their physicality, to their lived experience. Men claiming to be women, women claiming to be men. who have no idea what it is to experience life as the other sex. Have only a superficial appreciation of the other sex. Have only, if you like, the societal construct of the other sex. And again, what is all of that about? But extreme subjectivism. And with it, of course, has come relativism so that people say well that's your truth and this is mine that may be true for you but it's not true for me and that irrespective of facts irrespective of empirical evidence what is that but extreme subjectivism it's all about me myself and I it's all about what I see what I hear what I want to see and what I want to hear it's fables it's fantasies it's whims and fancies it's vanity of vanities And this is what has infected the church. So that now our theologians, rather than trying to discern and understand and interpret the objective truth as presented in divine revelation and in creation instead, now try to interpret everything through a subjective lens, from a subjective perspective. This is, my brothers and sisters, the situation today. So we need now, more than ever, a Saint Dominic. We need now, more than ever, another St Thomas Aquinas. We need now another St Vincent Ferrer. And all the other Dominican saints, and all the saints throughout the ages but particularly those who were gifted by God to be able to recognize and understand the objective truth of divine revelation and help and enable, facilitate others 
to recognize and accept it. Perhaps yet there will emerge from our contemporary Dominican brothers such a voice of reason, of true knowledge. We must pray so. For sure, my brothers and sisters, to coin a phrase misapplied elsewhere, for sure we need a reform of the reform. We need holy men and women, not just sacred ministers and religious, but faithful Christians. Because when you strive after holiness, when you strive after purity, when you strive after divine revelation, knowledge and understanding of it, You have to rise above one's base instincts. One has to rise above one's own subjective appreciations. One has to use and employ the higher intellect and ability to rationalize and reason. As always, and as it has ever been, personal holiness. Personal holiness is both the preventative vaccine and the cure for what ails contemporary humanity. Let us pray, my brothers and sisters. Let us pray that indeed God may inspire and motivate and call such as the likes of those previous great saints, great teachers, great seekers after truth, and holiness. But while we wait for God to reveal such saints to us, let us ourselves pursue holiness and right reason. Let us ourselves strive with all our heart, soul, mind and strength To be the best person we can be, not as the world thinks and appeals to our vanity, but rather as our Lord directs, denying ourselves, taking up our crosses and following him ultimately to perfect union with God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.